black. Something began to go horribly wrong. 
Now, we should begin by stating that there was unavoidably going to be some kind of decline from his 500 million view high point, as almost every gaming YouTuber was going through this same early 2020 viewership surge as a direct result of the pandemic. So if we ignore these views which have come about from people simply being at home, the real decline of Jelly began in early 2021. To cut Jelly some further slack, we should also highlight that Minecraft Among Us and GTA 5, the three main games that he was making videos on at the time of his decline, were well past their peak in popularity on YouTube, and therefore you could definitely make the argument that the first reason for Jelly's viewership decline was that people were simply getting bored of watching these games, which is a problem still faced by the gaming genre today. There haven't been any hugely popular game releases after Among Us in February 2021, uh. which was basically the same month where Jelly's views began to decline. Therefore, the most popular games that Jelly can play are Roblox, Among Us, Minecraft, and GTA 5, all of which are years beyond their peak in popularity. Jelly has clearly noticed this problem himself, judging from one of his tweets reading, Can GTA 6 just be released already? With a possible motive for this being that Jelly is tired of playing the same old games on his channel. This might also provide an explanation for why Jelly's content has become a lot more repetitive and far less innovative. Back when his views were exploding in 2019, Jelly was pushing the absolute limits in terms of ideas, thumbnails, and titles, which as mentioned previously, was aided by the abundance of different popular games. These days, however, it feels as though Jelly isn't pushing these boundaries in the same kind of way. The ideas, thumbnails, and titles feel almost identical to where they were three years ago, but they're now being applied to less popular games. Then there's the problem of the content itself, which in all honesty just doesn't feel like there's that much- My hair look wet. It. Sure, the <laughs> editing on each video is fantastic, but they give off the vibe that Jelly's just played some random game for 30 minutes, sent the footage off to his editor, and taken the rest of the day off. Now, I'm sure that this certainly isn't the case, but for some inexplicable reason, Jelly gives off the vibe that he isn't as committed to the content as he used to be, which is an absolute necessity for the growth of a channel. It's no coincidence that a creator like Mr. Beast is constantly going out of his way to reiterate that he wants to be doing YouTube for at least another decade. He's signaling to the audience that he's in it for the long run, and he knows that as soon as you stop committing to your YouTube channel, the audience will as well. Meanwhile, Jelly does the opposite to this by stating that he sees his own channel as being dead. I'm not on this list. Where on this list do I belong? I consider myself pretty dead. Hey, I, I consider myself to be in the dead category as well, all right? I'll still leave you in there. And to make things even harder for himself, Jelly makes it very obvious that he's distracted by unnecessary things from outside of his channel. Now, we're going to make a point that's somewhat similar to the one made in the Quebblecop video, being the foolishness behind sharing your luxury lifestyle to social media, although we're going to approach it from a slightly different angle, because if anything, it's worse in the case of Jelly, as he's so obviously distracted by ego-related purchases. In early 2021, during the same time period where his views began to decline rapidly, Jelly announced that he'd purchased a $10 million boat. At the start of this summer, I actually ended up buying myself a nice boat. In the very same video, Jelly explains that he's also purchased a green Lamborghini home. Uh -huh. <laughs> A Lamborghini to go with his already existing Lamborghini Urus. And in September 2022, Jelly posts another video explaining that he's bought an abandoned mansion, which looked as though it needed a fair bit of work and a lot of time away from being committed to YouTube. Uh, it's a bit of a mess. I, I didn't make the mess, okay? I just bought a bunch of things. So why is this a problem? I see so many business people get burned. And what they do is they start making some money and then their lifestyle just creeps and it grows into this massive hungry beast that then consumes them. And what you've got to be very careful with is you can't let the byproducts of your thing distract you from your thing. This is a principle that someone like Mr. Beast understands perfectly. He's always voicing his disdain for luxury and anything that removes the focus from the growth of his channel. On the other end of the spectrum, you have someone like Jelly, who seems to be searching for distractions, and it's clearly having an impact on his ability to produce top quality content. For example, in July 2022, Jelly uploaded a video titled This Isn't Working Out, in which he'd explained that after many years, he was no longer able to produce two videos per day, and was instead going to start releasing just one. Starting now, I am going to quit. 
This was justified by Jelly stating that the quality of each video should increase. Lowering the quantity should up the quality. At least that's my goal. If I can spend more time on a video, that video will turn out better. Although the quality didn't actually change much after posting this, meaning that Jelly was simply uploading half as often as before with minimal change to the substance of the videos. Then there was the collapse of the robust trio, but for the second time. We mentioned earlier that Quebblecop, who had close to 15 million subscribers, left the trio in 2019, but was instead replaced by Denmark's most subscribed YouTuber called Craner. Well, Craner continued to play with Jelly and Slogo for roughly two years. However, like Quebblecop, he also began to appear in fewer and fewer videos. In May of 2022, fans noticed that Jelly and Slogo had removed any mention of Craner in their video descriptions, leading everybody to believe that Craner had been kicked from the trio. Well, four months later, Craner would take to his YouTube community tab to make the following announcement. Too many theories out there about why I'm not recording with the guys anymore, and I thought, although I always like to keep private, why not just address it so people don't get the wrong idea? Jelly and Josh are great people, and I wish them the best. Last year, and also somewhat into 2022, was the toughest time I've gone through. I lost my dad, came out of a long relationship with my ex-wife around the same time too. As most of you know, this resulted in me not recording for weeks or a month at a time. The guys were very understanding and sweet. However, no drama happened. I didn't use them to garner attention then leave. And for people saying I just use them for views, wouldn't it make a lot more sense to stay recording with two of the biggest creators on the platform? I think so. I wanted a change and I wanted to do my own thing once. This post not only confirmed the end of the trio, which had made Jelly so successful in the first place, but it also felt like the death of innovation and authenticity on Jelly's channel. The robust trio represented a time when Jelly seemed passionate about making videos, as is highlighted in old comments such as, I enjoyed it more when they were actually having fun instead of just acting for family friendly. However, while this comment represents the tragic decline of a much-loved content creator, it simultaneously shows just how much of an impact these three legends had on the content creation sphere and the lives of millions. Hmm. Yo. Yo, what's going on, bro? Yuck. Yo, you got new drip. You like it? We gotta have a talk, okay? Alright, I'm gonna get you to have a blow up, okay? Why didn't it go up? I got drip. You gotta lose some weight, okay? But if you lose weight, you can get all the girls you want. I don't know if I like girls right now. You're going with him? Or No, no, no. This is that's, I just don't think about girls right now. Oh, good, because he got me fucking low up, I ain't gonna lie. You trying to fuck your life up? Take some of this, motherfucker. Are we in jail? Motherfucker, what the fuck is this? Hey, put your fucking seatbelt on, we're about to come on. Yo, why, why are we in a car chase? No, you're not. Get my gun for a minute. I only wanted to hold it while you shoot me. You are not holding my hand. Dun, 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 dun. <clears throat> I want to react to this because it's been a while. This is a long video. So it's just you, everybody. Okay guys, uh, thank you for today. I really, really appreciate it. Tapi before kita pack up to leave, right? I'm so sorry, but can we brainstorm for a bit? Because I really need to plan for the next POV. Is it okay? Iya. Yeah. Korang pergi dulu. I kena take down kat depan. Eh, mana pun kena take down ni kau ah. Okay, okay, proceed, proceed. Jom, kau nak brainstorm kan? Aku record ni boleh? Okay, okay, go, go, go. Sorry guys, but I really really need to brainstorm pasal we have a big upcoming event and I need to already plan the next POV already. And since what I pernah dengar, some of you guys cakap you guys have encounters kat sini kan? So since kita kat sini, why not kita all out just brainstorm? A quick one lah. Uh, it's my first time here so... Ah, eh, eh tempat ni yang dia pernah ceritakan. Yang mana tu? Eh, Haji tak bilang kau? Aku dengan Haji dah penuh. I really tak ingat ke. Uh, maybe kau can refresh my memory. Okay. Sekarang ni, dekat sini. Aku nak dekat satu jam tunggu kau kau kat sini. Kau tak sampai-sampai. Mana kau? Oh, okay lah, okay lah. Bye. 
Oi, ya Allah tadi. Aku tunggu Lokman dah. Udah ni tu semua tadi gini. Mana ada? Ni nampak sangat ke? Nampak sih. Eh, baik semua ah. Kau pakai sapi indik lagi. Panas tu. Kau tengok macam ni bila aku. Aku banyak kali jiting, jiting tak ada. Kau tak faham ke? Aku kerja shift. Biasalah. Perempuan depan ni ada. Kau kena faham ni. Tak adalah aku. Kadang-kadang pagi aku dah bershift semua kau. Aku tahu, aku tahu. Aku tahu kau boleh maju gini banyak. Tapi aku tengok kau. Kalau kau api dia api, habis eh sekejap kau. Penat dia lah aku maju gini. Ya, asal macam gini kau busuk macam telur basi gini. Eh, ya Allah. Eh, Aziz. Bil, Aziz, Bil. Mana? Eh? Hmm. Ah, biarlah. Eh, jom aku tengok-tengok lah. Salah, malah aku. Uh, aku nak ikut lah. Kau pergi lah. Zik lalu. Kau dengan cikis Masa kau tengok-tengok aku Tak happy My head turning. What was that run? Aku tengah sibuk kerja si Adi. Kita tu tua mana entah sibuk tantan aku. Pati kau. Oh, tu kau rupanya. Oh, tu abang. Sorry, abang. Saya rabak hari tu. Oh, kau rabak. Aku lagi pening kepala, kau tak tahu. eh. Lepas kau orang buat hal tadi, macam-macam benda pelik berlaku, kau tak tahu. eh. Uh, bang, sorry. Eh. Benda apa yang berlaku? Tak adalah benda-benda pelik. Alah, abang. Eh, Aziz. Tak ada orang tak sulit sebagai. Eh, ya. Mel acting dah. Sebenarnya, cerita macam ini. Waktu aku tengah petrol, tiba-tiba aku ternampak. Eh. Hmm. Eh, berapa ni? Dang. Adalah budak-budak ni.
nobody puts their flashlight like Oh my gosh. Hello? Hey, why are you sitting here? Can I see the tape, Z? Why cannot? It's not public either, what? Cannot see here, lah. Got tape, what? Why cannot, lah? Really cannot, lah? Go, 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 go. Okay, lah, okay, lah. Open, open, lah. Let, lah. What did he say? Under like an accent. What is this? Like a garage? Tricks are for kids. Behind you with the little whisper. I'm upstairs, uh, checking, but uh, nothing, nothing here. So far, nothing, nothing. Nothing, 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 nothing. Ain't no way. The lights just change. The, the, the color. Bro, I get the itis. Oh no. I can like. Follow my heart and 
to the side for a American. See how he turned that way without looking behind him, really. Dude's behind him, bro. Over. Yes, I'm still at the tower. I already checked. Okay, uh, I know what's happening. I have the evidence ready. I'm coming down. Roger. Plastic. What did he even did he eat it? Did he, did he smell it? Like, come on, what was that transitioning? This is kind of uh, all right, you know what I'm saying? Dum bum ba dum The itis is hitting me But I'm going to not play that don't worry
shoot it for now as well, too. like not that Follow my shine into the fire guy. Burn got broken down by the side. Wait, this is... Just trying to find some back, back control. So dun 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 what's E D M C 
see pretty much like this, but There it is. Oh, what we need. go right here let me end it with this and that we add this final bus here is it nicely Come on now, we need you, we need you. I like it like the art.
think it's too much like 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 click this thank you something right there just something throw me off Ah, my, 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 my. Ant Man with some dookie butt buns. Thank you for the bit. Neil, you're always coming in through. You're always coming through, bro. Appreciate you, bro. And, bro, spoils. Gotta watch it. It's one day. One day. It's like, I'll still watch it because I just like watching you know what i'm saying like just to watch it even though like ant man's kind of cool you know what i'm saying it, it's not a priority but yeah like priority priorities are like spider-man and other movies you feel me my ears my ears my ears So we go into the beat. Well, actually, that's like. So I'm thinking a little bit. My ears every time, bro, they do this. Awesome. And now we we wait. Yes, waiting is great. There we go. Started from the top, now bottom, now we. Yeah. Uh, I'm back up and streaming. I don't know when I'll stop, but I'ma hit it hot, uh, like in the parking lot. Uh, it's in the summer that I think of winter, cause I'm cold. I don't wanna be so bold. Uh, been playing Harry Potter, been shooting them charms and them spells. I don't know what rings the bell, but I wanna be one to tell. Uh, if I go up and down, I wanna swing back around. I don't wanna go in town. I wanna. Go back to the laundry room, wash my clothes, uh I know everything's dirty, how about those? You know where it go I go back to the gym, I wanna go back and swim I wanna be free, I wanna be eating some ice cream mm. Vanilla Swirl is the best kind of girl, what? I wanna be on your team, yeah, shooting laser beam mm. 
got my wand in my hand I don't understand but I got the plan but you know what pause it I always like try to throw some vocals in there. I can never throw my own vocals, it's so hard. Let's see if like if I were to sing something, just like e o o o o o e o e o o o. But if I add like some, what's that called? Auto tune to it, it might sound like good. Do I start off right here or like all the Switch it up to think about something else so I can compare the two. say retro this one it's hard unless i like do all of that gosh see and i stop it probably want to add Thank you. 
to do it. Rebirth it. Uh, put that high. like right there. No. Heck. Can't hear. Okay. Mm. 
Wait, I was cooking, I was cooking, I was cooking. I was cooking. Wait, no. Cooking just a little, just a little, just a little. It was cooking. It was cooking. Gosh. Choose the vocals, vocals. Can you imagine? Can you imagine us, baby? Can you imagine us? Can you imagine us, baby? Yeah. Uh, uh. Imagine what's the sound like? What's the sound like? So let's start like no no it's uh right here just Start like a hell. For sure not. For sure not. Right there's the answer. Hey. It's like it has to start right there, bro. It has to. Oh, whoopsies. Forgot how to split. Now. It's 
it's like mm, I just like start I'm gonna find gonna be so simple but I Ukulele, I know how I Cooking, I'm cooking. This will probably help. Just, just uh, make a duplicate. Yeah. Pitch, 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 pitch. Uh, it's a G, so I made it. It's a G F usually sounds Hmm. Let's go to G and then let's uh push a plus sign. 
I learn with these darn fucking that's how nasty. What would this sound like? I just Ew. Where's the So... What do you think would sound good? I tried to get vocals in there f for sure.
Holla. No, you're not. Try to add like a uh, like a chorus, like a choir, Facebook choir. So, plan. Okay. Tricky, tricky, tricky. Because of this, everything's kind of like not the same. duplicate this with this below yeah let's split this one right there delete that turn it down split this delete delete This can stay. And this can have reverb on it. So we can end with the bang ish with that one. Hey, it was not done not done harmonizing
have a hair. Wait, 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 wait. This is right there. Boom. Oops. But go here, go here. Eh. This, I feel like, needs more, more. from that Yoni Unai Yoni What's that sound like? Should I? Should I? Be like that? So at first we'll hear it like this. I 
I'm gonna miss you. I'm gonna miss you. I think we gotta leave it. I think we're gonna leave it. Feels, it would feel nice to add more. Oh yeah, wait. I swear I had, uh, I did. Let's sell my computer. going on so much going on the, the the tapping it's a tapping So we're going to probably just turn it down. middle uh twitched there it is wait no it, it just stopped I'm done Leave it in there still. We could. Um. the tapping
got it. I think we got it. Uh, so. What to do? <laughs> right. It sounds like. So it's hard because of <laughs> Come on, think, 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 I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Just trying to okay last time to know where perfect stop is. Um Wait. Okay, okay. I was tripping for a little bit. Boom, boom. That out, put it back in. Wait. Okay, there we go. Should I? a weird place to do that maybe let's see
could actually add another uh Should have just done that, huh? It's hard. Because it would be cool, probably right there. Let's let's like lower that down just a little, put a little bass on it. We could put like just a tad reverb. We don't always want a lot. And then we add the effects to make uh, you know the bass a little higher. We don't want too much. We don't want too much of that. Also. Can we play it? We could, we could be like, welcome back. Uh, I can't, I need to see everything. <laughs> Cringe. Oh no. I'm watching. Oh, it's so cringe. Okay. 
Oh. throws me off when it cuts off we're gonna end it like right here like like soon like or it's like oh, I hate when it does that That's okay. I think I think that's cool. I really want to add it right there. Whoops. Hey, yo.
wonder what it would sound like if I brought this back. Is this that I ever up the base? Nope. Ooh, 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 ooh. Should I like, no, no? It works. It works. Ew. I don't know, I might take that out.
Okay, the sound looks so muffled. It's like a breath, like I would breathe retro. It starts off as retro, but it's like hmm. breathing retro, breathing retro, retro, breathing. Breathing retro. Mixing, 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 mixing. Ucha, lucha, uto, lucha. What is that? Oh yeah. What is this? Pokemon just showed some big love to XQC. Pokey wanted to try out GTA RP again, and it seems like no other streamers wanted. I can't. Uh, oh, 
Pokemon just showed some big love to XQC. Poke wanted to try out GTA RP again, and it seems like no other streamers wanted to show her the rope besides XQC. XQC is such a, how do you say, a down ass which I really appreciate about him. Like, you ask him to do something, and if he doesn't want to do it, he's not going to answer. But usually he is so down. Pokemon just showed some big love to XQC. Pokemon the okay. I'm like looking. Uh. I can't find. Can't find. Uh... Oh well. I can't find it. No, I know not that funny. Then we're gonna go here, then we're gonna go there, and then we're gonna scroll down till we find something nice. Mm. The story of Elon Musk. There's a lot of rich people in the world, but it's not a lot of rich people living like you. So first of all, before you can get started, I salute you, sir. I went broke, so I was just like, it was a, it was a wild ride. How good is Dan Bovarian actually at poker? Where did Dan get his money from? How, you may ask, does this billionaire playboy philanthropist finance his life? You know, I beat one guy for 54 million. I mean, I won 10 and a half on another night. I beat another guy for 10. He claims to have won over $50 million in one year of playing poker. He's the son of convicted corporate fraudster Paul Bilzerian. The trust fund Ponzi scheme inheriting pseudo commando wannabe Kirkland brand Q Hefner. Paul Bilzerian. A Wall Street felon. I think night is dead in the water. We're just waiting for the official announcement. They have no cash. They have no operation. Nothing is going on with Ignite. It's game over. There was always something a little bit weird about him, don't you think? Whether it was an inability to accept the reality of his eccentric lifestyle or the prolonged awkwardness whenever anyone asked where his money came from. How much money have you made playing poker? I don't know. I, I mean... Something felt off every time. So when an overwhelming array of evidence came forward regarding the fake golden facade of Dan Bilzerian's dream lifestyle, I think it's safe to say that no one was all that surprised. But the real question might be, how did he even get to the point of having that fake golden facade? And how did it all come crashing down? How did Dan Bilzerian go from a dude who got kicked out of high school for bringing guns to school? I kicked out of high school and joined the military to a guy living almost the dream lifestyle to a guy who's being roasted by every corner of the internet for being a fake and a fraud the entire time after hours of extensive research i bring you the rise and fall of a man who built his life on a lie dan bilzerian lavish holidays high status the ability to do whatever you want whenever you want all aspects of the filthy rich lifestyle. I'll set the scene for you. It's the 1980s, New York, Wall Street specifically. 
Suits with shoulder pads, pants with suspenders, and when dodgy Wall Street raiders were abusing financial loopholes to make cash hand over fist. One of these slick Wall Street swindlers was an individual by the name of Paul Bilzerian a businessman, real estate investor, and corporate takeover specialist, who by abusing these loopholes managed to make upwards of $400 million in certain specific years. Still made $400 million that year, you know, suck it. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Bilzerian had been so successful that he decided to set up a trust fund for his two kids, Daniel and Adam Bilzerian, who at the time were both younger than 10 years old. Now, whether the trust fund was set up under the guise of compassion or the security of his kids' futures, there was somewhat of a catch to the fund. Much of the money in there had possibly come from illegal activity. He's indicted for like tax and security fraud. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. In 1989, Paul Bilzerian was convicted of fraud, conspiracy, and making false statements to Wall Street government bodies. Your father was a corporate takeover specialist. He went to jail for his business practice. Much of his fortune had been made illegally. Paul Bilzerian was ordered to pay his entire net worth Dude, of 62 fuck. million dollars to the government as well as serve 13 months in prison. So uh, how did you find out he was going to jail? Can we go on away? And I was like, well, what do you mean? Oh, He's like, oh, well, you know, we didn't get this appeal. So it's safe to say that by age 10, his son, Daniel Bilzerian, Dude. didn't exactly have the greatest role model when it came to being honest in business. But the story doesn't end there. By 1991, two years after his conviction, Paul Bilzerian filed for bankruptcy, a bizarre move considering just two years previously he had a net worth of $62 million. Where could the money have gone? Well, this is where things get a bit gray, Dude. but it seems as though much of the money was put into the trust fund set up for yeah. Adam Bilzerian. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. By 1997, welcome back, welcome back. the trust fund was worth Look, around $12 million. I've been away, million, I've been playing Which puts Dan Bilzerian's net worth at $6 million by the age of 17, assuming a 50-50 split between him and his brother. Safe to say a pretty decent head start in life comparative to his peers. So now that we've set the scene for Dan Bilzerian's life in the beginning, let's progress a little bit here. Paul Bilzerian going to jail began somewhat of a chain reaction for what would happen to Dan Bilzerian through his teenage years. The imprisonment of his father led Dan Bilzerian to get excessively bullied at school, which he described as traumatizing. That sucked, man. I, you know, you got to go to school and all these kids are making fun of you and your dad's going to jail. It's like, I was kind of traumatizing moment. The result of the bullying and perhaps a lack of guidance from a father figure in the household caused Dan to lose interest in school, slacking off and being kicked out ah. in seventh grade. I mean, look, I got kicked out of school, seventh grade, so I ended up living with my aunt and uncle. Dan Bilzerian then went to military school, then back to public school, where Dan would make somewhat of a stupid decision, ultimately landing him in prison. I got thrown in jail my senior year, so I didn't really have a senior year. What do you year. go to jail for? At the age of 17, Dan was kicked Ew. out of his senior year of high school for having a machine gun and shotgun in the back of his car. Not only was Dan kicked out of school, he was also thrown in jail for the incident. I got thrown in jail um, my senior year of high school, so I didn't graduate. So with the little information we have on Dan Bilzerian's early years, it's safe to say that he wasn't really suited to school. So what could be the best alternative to school for Dan? Well, I mean, he could have gotten a job on a construction site or maybe a local fast food place. But neither of those seemed somewhat appropriate for his personality type. So instead, Dan Bilzerian decided to join the military with the hope of becoming a Navy SEAL at the age of 18. But there was a problem here. Started running, I got an overuse injury, turned into a stress fracture. As soon as Dan Bilzerian began military training, he fractured both of his legs from overuse, assumably from training too hard. Now this was an awful outcome for Dan, considering he was about to join the military. And most individuals would have just given up at that point of breaking both your legs. But what happened next did nothing besides display the insane work ethic and resilience of Dan Bilzerian. He went through Navy SEAL Hell Week. Class, he didn't really like me, so he had me on watch every single night. Do the whole course again so they rolled me all the way back did the whole thing he again. couldn't even find excuses the third time he just admin dropped me i didn't even know that was like a thing i didn't even know you could get admin dropped but just as displayed after everything dan was unable to complete military training owing to his injuries dan had to drop out of the military at the time being devastating but later describing his military dropout to be a blessing in disguise at around age 22, after having to leave the military, Dan Bilzerian decided yeah. to go welcome to college, back, back, where back, he would back, learn back. the skill that would apparently yeah. lead to his financial freedom. Dude, I uh, welcome went to college back, with UF. Back. And that's where you learned how to play poker? Yeah, my brother taught me, and then uh, I was playing in college. I was playing like some online stuff. I had a couple of fraternity brothers that were real into it, and they taught me a little bit. And... Do you remember how we mentioned that Dan Bilzerian had a brother towards the start of our story? Well, that brother, an individual Yo, by the name of Adam Bilzerian, happened that to color. be a professional poker player. In college, my brother taught me how to play poker. After receiving $6,000 from back, his honorable military back, discharge, back, Dan Bilzerian look, began I've been playing away, playing I've poker. been playing. You know, I was getting the GI Bill, and the uh, VA was paying me, and I was getting Some grants and everything for uh, for school, and so I was making pretty good money for a college business. student. Dan began by playing with his brother, business. then with college friends, then finally online. 
But in the beginning, Dan wasn't very good because only one year after beginning in his second year of college, Dan went Business. broke. Business. Went broke my sophomore yeah, year. So what was his solution? I, I, Not to know, stop gambling and, you know, make money with a guaranteed method, but instead to sell three guns to fund more gambling. And I actually had to, like, sell three of my guns. Um, and then I took that money and went and like played on this gambling boat. And while this sounds like the stereotypical pathway of a problem gambler, this would actually prove to be one of the smartest choices Dan would make in his early life. I sold three guns for 750 bucks, played on this gambling boat for a week, turned it into 10,000, went to Vegas, and then turned that into 187,000 at Bellagio after playing for three weeks straight. Never forget it. And this is where the real rise would begin for Dan Bilzeri. Apparently after turning $750 into 187,000. But it also happened to be the same time where the skepticism would begin for Dan Bilzerian's apparent poker skills. All in all, while Dan did play very aggressive, I wouldn't say that he played all that great. In fact, there was some serious button clicking going on in this match. I think that maybe Business. he could beat some high stakes, it's very soft serious. live games, but on know, the internet, he's a fish in the water. Many of Dan Bilzerian's poker games have been absolutely torn apart by real poker pros, showing how awful Dan is at the game. This has led many people to question the legitimacy of Dan Bilzerian's actual source of wealth, which will be important for later parts of the video. Dan states to have beaten one individual for 54 million and two other individuals for 10 million dollars each. Like I beat one guy for 54 million, and 54 million yeah stating that he was able to beat them because the poker pros just weren't that good back in the day dan Bilzerian's apparent poker escapades continued up until the year 2010 the year when the life of dan Bilzerian would really take off so here's a recap of the story so far dan goes to military drops out goes to college learns to play poker and apparently makes millions of dollars between the age of 25 and 30 which is where we'll continue our story now despite being a multi-millionaire by 30 years old dan's life wasn't all smooth sailing because in 2011 Dan broke up with his playboy model girlfriend just after moving to LA. I was dating this one girl and uh, she was a playboy playmate. We ended up breaking up. Now while on the surface this was clearly a negative Dan instead saw it as a positive because his newly single status provided an opportunity to do whatever he wanted whenever he wanted fulfilling his bucket list. And I was single and I was just like you know what it. I'm just kind of kind of like do bucket list shit. like whatever I, <laughs> like whatever I want to do when I was a kid I'm just gonna do it you know and i just did and i but there's something else to quickly touch on before we go any further 2011 also happened to coincidentally be the same year where he was finally able to access his multi-million dollar trust fund as left from his dad dan bilzerian later claimed to have only taken a very small amount and given the rest back saying that he didn't really need or care about the money i, I took i took like a little bit from that and Gave the rest away. But to me, this seems a bit fishy for obvious reasons, especially considering in another interview, he said he didn't take any and just gave it to his brother. Did you get a trust no. from him? I did, but I gave it to my brother. Regardless, wherever the money came from, Dan Bilzerian was absolutely minted by 2011. And as a fresh bachelor, just wanted to do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. Dan began posting pictures of his insane lifestyle to the photo sharing application Instagram beginning in May 2012. Dan began posting photos not to get famous. Was it was it part of a master plan or was it just fun? No, man, I was just... But it was like never like really to become famous, you know what I mean? It was just kind of like, you know, I was just doing my thing and, you know, we were getting pictures here and there. But rather to get back at his ex-girlfriend. It was kind of like a f*** you to her. Show poker pros that he was just some rich idiot. I wanted to be the rich idiot. I didn't want to be the guy that hung out with poker players. Like, I didn't want people to think I was good. As well as the possibility of attracting other women now that he was single. And that was really like the whole like start of this thing was just to kind of, you know, subtly brag online and get laid easier with less effort. And social media was like kind of a tool for that. Dan began by posting fairly minor photos such as random photos with his brother, his cars, and him feeding chickens. But as time progressed, began posting more outrageous pictures of him with different girls, private I jets, and an unachievable lifestyle. Now, for obvious reasons, this started to pique a lot of interest. Who was this crazy jack dude with a beard living a 16-year-old bucket list lifestyle with all these hot girls and just posting it to Instagram for fun? Was this guy legit? Was it all fake? Was he paying the girls? Well, these questions caused people to follow and get invested in the crazy life of Dan Bilzerian. The life of Dan Bilzerian began to spread like wildfire with every single male between 15 and 25 asking their friends, Yo, have you seen this insane Dan Bilzerian guy? As time progressed, the ridiculousness of the post steadily increased. And as the ridiculousness of the post steadily increased, so did his followers. Dan Bilzerian's oldest Instagram statistics show that by April 2014, no a little
little under two years after beginning Instagram, Dan Bilzerian was already at 1.34 million followers. One year later, in April 2015, he was at 7.5 million followers. Then 16 million one year later again. In a space of only four years, Dan Bilzerian went from an unknown poker player to what many media outlets were calling the king of Instagram. By September 2018, Dan Bilzerian's 24 million follower Instagram empire was big enough for Dan to launch his own brand, Ignite, selling apparel, beverages, and various smoking products. The company then went public at $2.50 a share in January 2019. Now it's safe to say that by this point, everything on the surface seemed to be going perfectly for Dan Bilzerian. Unlimited girls, a lifestyle that 99.9% .9 of people could only dream about, riches beyond belief, his own company. What could possibly go wrong? Well, as soon as Dan's company went public, the stock price fell from $2.50 to $0.54 cents per share, a drop of approximately 80%. All of the company yeah. descriptions began to read something about how important it was to be authentic as well as Dan stating this to be his personal philosophy. Yeah, I mean, and I try and be authentic. You know, another one of his quotes, you know, rather than love, rather than fame, rather than money, give me truth. But as the old rule in psychology goes, if you have to go to the effort of telling someone how truthful or authentic you are, chances are you probably aren't that authentic or truthful. Ironically, everything about Dan Bilzerian kind of reeked of a lack of truth. His inability to tell the truth about where his money came from, refusing to reveal how much he had won from poker, the true nature of his lifestyle, all factors possibly leading to investors steering clear of his company. And even if he had won all of his money from playing poker rather than inheritance, that would only make his case worse. Because it would show that he didn't have any experience running a company and much of his initial wealth was owed to luck, not good business skills. But honestly, this was only the beginning of the end for Dan Bilzerian. It was about to get way worse. According to a lawsuit filed this week, Dan Bilzerian rents his house and charges the rest of his six-figure lifestyle to a credit card that someone else pays off. Ignite lost $50 million last year and is likely to fail. Now I think it goes without saying, everyone knew that there would be a point where Dan's insane lifestyle would catch up with him. Whether it be from old age, his money running out, or even possible future mental health problems stemming from years of partying, we all had that same feeling of, yeah, this looks mad, but there's no way that all of this can be real. Which in July 2020 would be proven to be the correct judgment as an overwhelming array of evidence began to come forward hinting at the illegitimacy of Dan Bilzerian's lifestyle. No. The evidence began with Curtis Heffernan, former Ignite president, stating that he had been fired from Ignite for illegitimate purposes. Within the lawsuit was a stupid amount of information regarding Bilzerian's ridiculous spending habits, including a $65,000 Star Wars set, a $75,000 paintball field, $26,000 on boosting Instagram followers, as well as Business. paying for the various models seen on his Instagram. But the funniest I, part I, of this I, whole you know, thing was I that his huge attention. mansion was actually rented for $200,000 per month. Now, it. why is this so hilarious? Well, literally a week beforehand, Dan Bilzerian had shown Kevin O'Leary through the property gotta, stating to have paid 65 million for it. I gotta, he reportedly paid a mind-boggling okay. 65 million dollars for this mega mansion. And when Kevin O'Leary asked him about the tax rebates when he purchased it, he gets pretty uncomfortable for obvious reasons. Can you write any of this off? Because it's really promoting your yeah. brand and your lifestyle. I mean, I talked to my accountant about all of it. I don't <laughs> now this whole ordeal was basically the nail in the coffin for Dan Bilzerian's credibility. Anyone who thought, eh, he seems kind of fake, but there also seems to be elements of truth, then decided, yeah, this dude is a total fraud. But wait, it gets weirder. In September 2020, an article came forward claiming that Dan Bilzerian's dad, Paul Bilzerian, was allegedly running Ignite from behind the scenes. On June 6, 2020, you're in call with Paul Bilzerian. Paul freaking Bilzerian. Which just adds another level of dodgy to the okay. whole ordeal it's considering ridiculous. that Paul Bilzerian it's is not allowed to have anything to do with public Today we're doing something following like his prior conviction with the US new. government. Perhaps explaining why he's going to be like the Canadian series stock exchange after rather than the US stock series. exchange. And just to add a cherry on top new. of the cake, Dan Bilzerian claimed to speak to like his dad only four or five times per year. I talked to him um, probably series. four or five times after a year. Which is interesting after considering series. his dad is allegedly running the company behind the scenes. Ever since all of this information has come There's out, the like stock price of Ignite has gone from 90 see. cents per share to 26 cents, a drop see. of approximately 70% over the last four months. After Ignite Actually recently see. announced the yearly losses of $50 million, many are speculating that Ignite is done and will like potentially see. be bankrupt within see. the next few weeks. I believe that Ignite is no longer, I think Ignite be is like dead see. in the water. Up. We're just waiting for the official announcement. They have no cash, they have no operation. Nothing is going on with Ignite, it's game over. So if you're watching this in the future, maybe you already know the outcome. Series. And that's kind of where we're up to with Dan Bilzerian, the mighty king of Instagram. 
from a school dropout to a Navy SEAL to apparently a professional gambler to the king of Instagram to a CEO to being exposed as a liar to having his company on the brink of bankruptcy. I'm interested in people with the ability to climb the hierarchy better than anyone else. But what I don't like is liars. And that's exactly what Dan Bilzerian has been exposed for. A man who has built his whole life on a series of lies. Claiming to own the $65 million mansion when he didn't. Like claiming series, to be a professional poker series, player when no record showed that he ever was. Being extremely grey around everything series. when it comes to finances <laughs> and where his money came from. The whole human yeah, no, psyche has evolved around figuring out who we can and can't trust. After and those who can't be trusted are naturally sent to the bottom, after even series. if they do have other admirable qualities. After and this has been the fate of Dan Bilzerian. Years and years of lies, Let's growing see. and growing to get one big pinnacle in mid-2020. And it's safe to say that this one might bring him undone over the long term. I think as time goes on, people are going to, you know, they're going to start to see, you know, who I am. Mm. And, and, you know, that stuff will, you know, come through in interviews. And, and like I said, is you know, because the more people see and the more they do, the more as a little lad, you are. Mm. Uh, I didn't even play retro games. Oh, retro games and reading and play. Didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Welcome everybody back to Amnesia. With that, thank you everybody for 3k. I just said it like half an hour ago or whatever. And welcome to my Q&A video. This one being for 5,000 oh, subscribers and that's a crazy number. I did an Arcade. Amigo fan meetup uh, for 100k so this yesterday I hit 300,000 subscribers which is a crazy amount. I really can't thank you guys enough. I want to thank you guys so much for 500k. I'm going to hit this uh, later on. Thank tonight. you guys honestly so much for a million subscribers. 2 million subs. Guys, thank you all for 3 million subscribers. It's 5 million subs. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's a number that this just doesn't make sense anymore. The, uh, the fact that I'm half... Uh, for the last month or so, uh, you may have noticed that I've been away. I, I went on this mental health journey. I realized that there's a lot going on in the world. And I know I... The internet. It's called Judge, Ant Jury, and Extreme An Arcade. audience of individuals who are compassionate it's to those who follow the rules while simultaneously brutal to those who break them. Say the wrong thing. Do the wrong thing or follow the wrong path and they'll wipe you out of the game without a shroud of remorse. Now the creator we'll be looking at today is an interesting case study as he's one of the very few YouTubers who's had the opportunity to observe both if sides of the coin almost in a what? path if you're new from an name. overwhelmingly respected gaming YouTuber pulling 40 million views per month alongside some of the biggest names in gaming if you're new to a mere clown rejected by the very too. audience that made him so famous in the first place. An individual full of so much potential, building, growing, expanding mm. before... Mm. Mm. Ow. One or two stupid, stupid choices derailing a lifetime of hard work. This video will cover the whole story from a nobody to a creative ideal to a clown in the laughing stocks bound for the graveyard of dead creators. Join me as we cover the rise and fall of Craig Thompson, aka Mini Lad. Uh, what made you want to get into YouTube and what was the first video uploaded? Uh, what made me get into YouTube was a few friends in school told me about uh, this guy who's on I want you to cast your mind back to early 2011, a time period representative of rage comic memes, the popularization of the iPhone, and where the only political debate was whether Black Ops 1 or Modern Warfare 2 was the better Call of Duty. The rise of internet accessibility brought about the opportunity for simple-minded individuals to share content on what was a very much new, rising, popular media at the time, YouTube.com. At the time, YouTube was nothing in comparison to what it is today. But as previously mentioned, what it was doing was providing an opportunity to a small group of unique individuals looking to pursue a career in video creation. One of these select individuals was a simple 16-year-old high school student from Northern Ireland by the name of Craig Thompson. Who at the time would have never expected the roller coaster of a journey he would encounter by taking the road less traveled. After being inspired by one of the early YouTube trolling video legends, Call Me Kevin, Go and sell the game, you knob. No, I just bought it and I'm actually really enjoying it. It's a good game. Craig Thompson, aka Minilad, was inspired to create some similar content for himself. So I thought, right, this is what I want to do. I want to sort of 
make videos and try and entertain people. Wasting absolutely no time, Minilad got exactly what was needed to begin his content creation journey. So I got myself a TV and a PVR and I just went for it. The collection of required equipment was followed by the creation of his YouTube channel name, which similar to many other Call of Duty YouTubers at the time came from Crazy Gamertag. Minilad explained that the name came from a scenario where another friend already had the name Craiglad and decided to use Minilad as a replica. He ensures that the word Mini comes from the Hi. fact that he's younger than the other Craig and doesn't reference his height, being apparently six foot or six foot one. How tall are you? I am about six foot, six foot one or something like that. But because my name is Minilad, people sort of assume I'm like four foot three and just a complete midget. However, after seeing him stand next to Mini Minter, who is apparently six foot one, I question the legitimacy oh. of his statement. However, Craig Thompson's height, or lack thereof, had no impact on his ability to begin pumping oh, out content, to. because it wasn't long after the creation of the channel that the uploads would begin. Minilad's first upload was on the game Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 in early 2011. Um, this is my new Xbox channel. My other channel was uh, Effort Proportions, which I just put like... Minilad also states in his first video that he had a previous channel where he uploaded some content recorded with a Dazzle recorder. But I'm unable to find any information on this previous channel, so we're going to assume that it was deleted at some point. Following Minilad's first upload, Craig Thompson decided to employ the old strategy of trying to upload a bunch of different videos, none of which having any relation to each other, to see which one performs the best. The kind of content that was being uploaded was very similar to the other, let's be honest, garbage content that was being uploaded to the platform back in 2011. We're talking simplistic videos like Minecraft Let's Plays. Hey, what is going on YouTube? It's Minnie here, and we are back with some more Minecraft. Call of Duty Survival. Oh All right, what's gosh. going on YouTube? This is Minnie here, and uh, this is like my episode. Uh, All right, what's going on YouTube? Two of my little survival series that I'm trying to do. World's hardest game. You know, the kind of stuff that you think will get a million views on the first day, but to your surprise, barely cracks a hundred views in the first year. But that's all right. In that first period of time, discovering what works and what doesn't isn't the easiest of tasks. So maybe Minilad had the correct strategy at the beginning. But despite possibly having the right strategy, none of these videos worked all that well. As after six months of pumping out content, Minilad had only reached 300 subscribers. But 300 was still better than zero. And while 300 subscribers was not nearly enough to rival someone like PewDiePie, it was still enough for him to get noticed by a significantly larger YouTuber by the name of I Has Cupquake. This week's Gamer of the Week is a mini lad. Da -da -da -da. I could tell that he puts a lot of work into his channel. He really loves games he loves to help others but yeah if you guys like him subscribe to him i'm sure he would appreciate some loyal subscribers some active subscribers after being shouted out by i has cupquake minilad went from 300 to <sighs> 700 subscribers overnight a number that he found to be mind-blowing at the time so i think for that video from like 300 subs to like 700 subs like overnight i remember like screaming like because obviously when you double in subs no matter what sub size you're on you're like ah! It's happening! Now, doubling your subscriber count in one day is an excellent situation for any YouTube channel, but there was still a bit of an issue here. Minilad still had no real theme going on with his channel. The strategy was still just kind of post whatever I'm feeling like posting. A move that the most dedicated fans would respect, but would simply confuse the new subscribers as they wouldn't really know what to expect. It was clear that Minilad had the problem of having no clear theme on the channel, but this problem wouldn't last long, as it was shortly after that Minilad would figure out a video type that he loved to make while also benefiting the growth of his channel tremendously. Troll Tages. I started my uh, first Troll Tage video last week, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and make that a weekly thing. I normally don't like like to do schedules, or whatever, but yeah. I'm really, really enjoying doing troll tages. I'm gonna be honest with you, it's like a new love, love. <laughs> now, if we go back a few steps, we need to remember that Mini Lad actually began his YouTube journey after being inspired by Call Me Kevin, one of the most popular Call of Duty mm. troll channels at the time. So it only makes sense that in the process of trying out different types of content, Mini Lad would try uploading a troll montage for himself. Minilad's first troll montage was uploaded to the channel in February 2012, approximately seven months after initially creating the channel. Then the performance of this video led Minilad to upload another troll -tage, then another one again and again, eventually uploading a series of 10 different troll -tage videos. These videos were a massive success in comparison to what Minilad had uploaded previously, taking his channel from 1,400 subscribers to 3,000 subscribers in a period of only six months. Another aspect that was causing massive growth for Minilad was the improvement of his editing skills, which by 
3,000 subscribers had improved to a level to the point where he really started to enjoy editing and content creation. But it kind of, it starts to show you like where I started editing and where I really started to enjoy editing. And as you might expect, actually enjoying the process of creating the content would be a key ingredient for the future growth of his channel. This initial success with Call of Duty trolling was an indicator to Mini Lab that he should begin focusing on Call of Duty as the main game. So that's what he started to do. But once again, there was another issue. The trolling videos couldn't go on forever. I mean, Mini Lab could have just kept going until he hit troll charge number 653, but obviously the audience would have gotten bored. There's only so many times you can trap a teammate in the corner on Modern Warfare 3 before your audience goes, yeah, maybe time to watch something else, eh? But what Mini Lad had learned from the troll charges was how to combine a bunch of different funny videos into one big video. Or put slightly differently, he'd become skilled at making compilation montages, which at the time, as said by Mini Lad himself, weren't really much of a thing. Because funny moments wasn't really a thing before. Nowadays, it's everywhere. Nowadays, you see like funny moments, the title. Mini Lad transitioned from making troll charges into making Funtages, <laughs> Ninja Tages, <laughs> and Fail Tages. <laughs> with the ulterior intention of diversifying from basic trolling. Well, this turned out to be a good move for the Mini Lad channel, mm. as diversifying the Call of Duty content with different montages Welcome reached a wider to. audience, ultimately resulting mm. in subscriber growth going from 5,000 subscribers in January 2013 to 35,000 subscribers only six months later in June 2013. But it wasn't only the diversification of content that was causing Minilad's subscriber count to grow, it was also the increased production value of his thumbnails and implementation of proper branding. Between the beginning and the end of 2013, we can observe a clear change to high quality thumbnails, accompanied by an even more clear increase in views, likely owing to the high quality thumbnails and at this point a massively increased production value for the videos. With more views came more subscribers, and with more subscribers came more views. Most of these views, as previously mentioned, came from his highly distinguishable thumbnails, having the orange background and therefore being recognisable and relatable for a returning audience. It was also around this point, early 2013, that Minilad would be begin playing with what would later become known as the Vanos Gaming Crew. The Vanos Gaming Crew was a group of YouTubers that would all collaborate on a regular basis to ensure cross growth of each individual channel. This chart put together by Vanos shows all the members of the group, as well as their subscriber counts by date in the bottom right hand corner. If we pause the graph in early 2013 when Minilad began playing with them regularly, we can see that there were many YouTubers with larger audiences providing ample opportunity for the personal growth of Minilad. And this is exactly what happened. Watching the graph in fast motion, we can see Minilad go from 35,000 subscribers in mid-2013 to 200,000 by the end of 2013, only six months later. And it's not like the growth stopped there. By mid-2014, it was extremely rare for Minilad to be getting less than 500,000 views on a video, with many getting north of one or two million views, mainly owing to the hilarity of the videos and notoriety of the individuals that he was collaborating with, such as Vanos Gaming, who had over 7 million subscribers at the time. Then by late 2014, Minilad hit 1 million subscribers. And just before the video starts, I just want to thank you guys honestly so much for 1 million subscribers. Then 2 million subscribers. Also, 2 million subs. Guys? Guys? What? Then, you guessed it, 3 million subscribers. Again, thank you all for 3 million subscribers. It's, it's, it's getting to the point where I can't even, I literally can't put it into words anymore. It's just, it's humbling. I just... By 2017, Minilad's channel was performing so well that he purchased himself a property in LA, which was displayed <laughs> to the audience in a video. Finally bought myself a house away from noise complaints. By this point, the thumbnails and video quality had improved yet again. How pretty much every video being either I... a gaming video or a video with the Vanos Gaming crew, with the Vanos Gaming crew point being important for the downfall section later in the video. With more videos came more views and ultimately more subscribers. Minilad hit 4 million subscribers in mid-2017 and 4.5 million subscribers by the end of 2017. So you might say that 2017 was a pretty good year for Minilad. However, it would be the final year before the downfall would begin for Craig Thompson. In 2018, subtle signs began to show up here and there hinting at a change in Minilad's behaviour comparative to his previous years on the platform, most specifically relating to his relationship with the members of the Vanos Gaming crew. The amount of videos posted with the crew had almost dropped to zero, and fans began to notice that Minilad no longer played with a group that had helped him become so successful in the first place. With all this in mind, a donation was made during a Mario Kart stream asking why he was no longer playing with the group. Because I don't play Gmod anymore. 
That's all he does. Question done. I also, I'm also breaking off into a solo YouTube video because it's a lot more fun. Now, despite simply saying that it was mm. because of Gmod, there was an obvious hint of anger and bitterness in his voice tone, leading fans to become suspicious around the authenticity of his statement. This was then backed up by another live stream at a later date, where once again Minilad appeared to be a little bitter around the simple fact that they were playing Gmod. They're uh. still playing Gmod? Damn. For all this time, they're still yeah. playing Gmod? This again raised suspicions with his audience. Why was he so angry and rude towards the group just because they were playing Gmod? Well, what was said next might add a little bit of clarity, because this time around, Mini Lad also added the comment that he was kicked out of their chat. I mean, they kicked me out of all their chats, so I have no idea what the hell they're doing, so... Mini Lad then amended this comment, saying that he left on his own accord. Just to clear up some shit. Uh, I wasn't kicked. Followed by some clearly bitter comments about how much better he was doing since leaving. Yeah, they, all they did was play Fortnite and Gmod and then talk shit about other YouTubers. So I said, F that. I broke away from that group. I'm doing my own thing. I've never felt better. My community's stronger than ever. Man. I'm pulling more views than ever. And I'm personally a lot more happy as a human. But all this did was create more questions. Why was he sprung into an angry mood just by observing the game that they were playing? Why was he going to the effort of bragging about how well he was doing? That's almost a telltale sign of someone who's resentful, saying, ha ha, you might have kicked me out, but look how well I'm doing now. Someone who left on their own accord would have no reason to brag about doing better than they used to be. They would have just left and been respectful of whoever they had left. Plus, if he had left on his own accord, wouldn't he still be in contact with them and on good terms? Well, then let's analyze it a little bit further. There was a point in the video when Minilad said all they did was talk shit about other YouTubers. And then talk shit about other YouTubers. Well, what I'd guess is that the YouTubers he's talking about was actually him, hence leaving the group. As if they were bad-mouthing other random unrelated YouTubers, why would he leave? It's not like Mini Lad was some moral saint that would leave the group because they said something rude about this game some random YouTuber. The only reason you'd actually go to the effort of leaving the group if they were talking shit about you specifically. So here's how it probably went down. Vanos crew was gossiping about Mini Lad. Mini Lad got First angry and left on his own accord, but was clearly resentful towards the group from that point onwards. But here's where Mini Lad made the mistake. Instead of just accepting that sometimes people talk dirty about each other and being a man, moving on and staying in contact with them, he got resentful and as a result alienated the whole group by badmouthing them on stream. Why not invite Mini? I'll tell you why. He doesn't play with us. He left. And then he decided on stream to badmouth myself and my friends. Well, mainly just my friends. And I didn't appreciate that. So... I don't play with the guy lately. At a later date, Minilad stated that he was patching things up with the Vanos Gaming guys. I got to finally meet up with Brian. We're figuring things out. You know, we, we talked backstage at Evan's show and we, we shook hands and we're, we're going to work on it. So like, you know, I miss the dude and it's good to see things coming together. Which was shut down by Terrorizer afterwards saying that the statement wasn't true. Uh, so yeah, I don't particularly want to work with the guy. I know first he made a video saying we're patching things up, which is not true. I feel like he says things in order the to first game we're gonna get flack off his back. Now this whole scenario was the beginning of the end for Minilad for two main reasons. Uh, one subtle reason and one more obvious reason. The subtle reason was that Minilad was publicly displaying his proclivity for lying to his audience in order to save his own reputation. Saying that he was patching things up with the Vanos crew when he clearly wasn't. Saying that he was kicked out by them when he wasn't. Being unclear about why he was angry and bitter towards them pretending that it was for some unknown reason that he left when it was clearly because they did him wrong in some way that he wasn't willing to admit possibly because he realized that it was so petty that coming out about it would ruin his own reputation death by a thousand cuts with each cut relating back to why mini lad wasn't all that trustworthy as a person and the, the first audience game began to notice you can tell when you're being lied to the first and when game you get we're found out the audience loses elevator instant respect. Action. Now, the more obvious reason for why this might have been the beginning of the end was that Minilad was alienating a whole group that could clearly help with his growth into the future. Action. Now, obviously, it's impossible to quantify, Elevator but what action. percentage of Minilad's 5 million subscribers at the time had come from collaborations Blade. with other Elevator. huge YouTubers in the group? Vanos, H2O, Delirious, Wildcat, having 23 million, 11 million, and 6 million subscribers, respectively, at the time? When you go from consistently playing with other insanely large creators to going out and doing your YouTube mission solo, a slowdown in growth is almost inevitable which was exactly what happened following mini lad's beef with the crew because by september 2019 following all the drama as well as a self-proclaimed drop in video quality i just didn't feel like the videos were good enough mini lad's subscriber growth halted stagnating at 5.74 million 
Now what's interesting to me is the fact that MeLed subscriber growth halted in September 2019, as this was a date before the true tsunami of drama would wash over the MeLed empire. On the 29th of December 2019, MeLed uploaded a video as he normally would, but following the video he didn't upload anything in January or the start of February for that matter. After 52 days of not uploading, MeLed released a video on the 21st of February 2020 titled Why I Left. It's been a minute. Uh, it's actually nearly been two months. Uh, since I uploaded a video. Minilad explained that he had broken up with his girlfriend. Sammy and I broke up. Um, I'm not gonna get into too much. Which is a fair enough reason uh, for not uploading videos. That would have been a tough thing for anyone to go through. But his other reason for not uploading possibly rubbed a lot of his fans the wrong way. For those who've been around for a while, like I said before, it's... I struggle a lot with mental health issues. Um, you know, it's not some to just kind of brush aside it's not something you take seriously action. otherwise it's gonna catch up with you some and games exactly might be great now i want to be a bit do. careful with what i say about this because i mentioned this in the sky does minecraft downfall video and goddamn i could have never expected the level of backlash from commenting on someone's depression but here we go if you're going through some mental health issues that sucks of course <laughs> but using it as a victim card for why your videos haven't been doing as well is truly pathetic the respectable person is the one who is going through hell and has the nobility to deal with it on a personal level. But it's not, not to use it as a course, public like excuse like for your but behavior. It's not when YouTubers, course, like especially like male ones, come out about. Huh? What am I saying? But it's not okay, of course, like some might be. Huh. Mental health problems to their Dude. audience, it's usually to the detriment of their own but... channel. And that's all we'll say about that. Following Minilad's mental health break, he continued to upload videos but failed to see any subscriber growth. Staying at 5.74 million subscribers during the four months between February 2020 and June 2020, at which point two sets of allegations towards Minilad came out on Twitter which would prove to be the final nail in the coffin. I was manipulated and completely used by Minilad, aka Craig. On the 23rd of June 2020, at the peak of the second but rise in the Me Too movement, like two like women came forward on Twitter with stories relating to Minilad and sexual misconduct that took place back in 2017. The Twitter post basically outlined the fact that Craig had spoken with them sexually and even attempted to meet up with one of the girls, despite the fact that he knew that they were both underage at the time. I was 16, 17. Following the release of the statements, Minilad released a statement himself confirming the allegations, also taking another month and a half break from making content. Now, despite the publicity of the allegations, Minilad surprisingly didn't lose many subscribers in the beginning, only dropping 10,000 in the two weeks following the incident on Twitter. His first video following the break was but once again a mental I might try to like time. make it look My mental just took a turn for the worse, and I know I needed to get I back. Know. I needed to be around the ones who I love. Sleep I wanted to work on myself. Just... My mental it's health journey. Win, uh, I got myself you know? into therapy for the last Test month, the giving absolutely no attention to the allegations while Elevator. simultaneously blaming what was going on in the world for his problems rather yes. than taking personal responsibility Elevator. for his actions. I, I went on this mental health journey. I realized that there's a lot going on in the world, and I know Elevator. I just need to step away, and I know I just need to take care of myself. The video yes. ended up with a 50% dislike okay. ratio, accompanied by almost every comment having something to do with his inability to address the problem of play. Then the next video had an even worse like ratio, with even more comments talking about how he's ignoring the elephant in the room. Well, after this one, on the 3rd of September 2020, the pressure was too much and Minilad gave in to making a video about the allegations. Now that some time has passed and I've had time to reflect on everything and get a grand scope of everything that's been going on, I, I wanted to set the record straight. The video addressed the allegations, but as you might guess, the audience didn't really buy it. With many comments relating to the inauthenticity of the video, with the audience mm. having Welcome back. like the dislike uh -huh. ratio. Now it's questionable as to whether this video was a good choice for his channel as it seemed to be somewhat of a catalyst Dude, for its welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Going from 5.7 What just happened to my, what, 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 what? There it is. Dude, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Look, I've been away, I've been playing some business something serious I, I you know i have to attend to pretty much each day i gotta i gotta okay i'm a little addicted <laughs> so random hello and welcome to First game we're gonna be playing is Elevator Action. Some games might be great, 
some might be doo doo, but it's retro games, of course. Like some might be doo doo. Elevator. <laughs> Later. Oh, am I cracking up? Wait. Did I do it? Wait, 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 wait. I'm confused. Okay. Okay. Yes. I don't think I'm. We. Now I am. <clears throat> oh, oh, there we go. Now. I'm Oh, oh, there we go. Now, now I am to it. Let me see. Okay. Okay. So. We. Oh, there we go. Now I am. Uh, I might just get rid of that. Dude, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Look, I've been away, I've been playing some business. It's something serious that I, I, you know, I have to attend to pretty much each day. Some game. If you're new here, my name is Sean Hill, and welcome to. First game we're gonna Cheesy. be playing is Cheesy. elevator action. Wait, did I do it? Wait, 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 wait! I'm confused. Mm, I might as well, huh? I might as well. Uh. Might be do elevator. Wait, wait, wait! I'm confused. Okay. million just before the allegations to 5.48 million at the time of this video. Minulad has continued uploading as if nothing ever happened, however the dislike ratios are a pretty good indicator of how his audience currently perceives him. So as always, we'll finish the video by answering the ultimate question, what caused the downfall of Minilad? Well, in some cases, it's a bit of a gray area, but I think in this one, it's pretty crystal clear. A failure to take responsibility for various long-term upload breaks, being resentful and alienating a former group over the most petty of reasons. Then the most obvious one that sticks out like a sore thumb, soliciting sexual activity with multiple minors before they would come forth on Twitter. The rise of YouTube, as discussed in the beginning, has highlighted the rise of another phenomenon. You don't get anything for free. There is a price to pay for an individual's inability to conform to the rules of society. You want to be a dick to the people who made you? The price is the future growth of your channel. You want to alleviate all responsibility by blaming external factors for your shortcomings? The price is a loss of respect. You want to take the shortcut to gratification by preying on young vulnerable fans? The price is your career. Minilad never had a downfall. He's simply paying his debt to society for his shortcomings. And he's socially bankrupt. He has no value left. Okay. He's done. His goose is 110% oh, oh, cooked. <clears throat> second chance or no second chance, uh... the internet is judge, jury, and executioner. And the verdict for Craig Thompson's YouTube channel is death. Use Minilad as an example. You don't get away with anything. Ever. Wow. Wow. Greetings, YouTube. You don't know me. I'm oh. He doesn't know me. She doesn't know me. But trust me. You will know me. Welcome to Pussy Tube. Okay. During his peak, he was a king. Really, really, really long time ago, I was on the Ellen Show. And is it Yusuf? Yes. You got caught, right? Oh yeah. As you just saw, I got so into it during the YMCA. A lifestyle that 99% of people could only dream of. I paid 13500 a month to live by myself. 500 million views in 2015. When I had zero subscribers, I didn't say, nobody knows me, man. I'm never going to have a million subscribers. I said, no, I'm going to get a million subscribers. 
$200,000 every single month. Revenue started coming into my life from all different angles because I told the universe and I told myself I'm going to be a millionaire at a young age. However, as time progressed, as the YouTube landscape changed, as Wait, I'm confused. reputation okay. was stomped into the dirt, oh, oh, there go. Now began I... to fall out of the yeah. spotlight, <clears throat> his views started to decline, his fans began to leave, Wee. and in recent times he would announce that he planned on discontinuing YouTube as a creator. Wee. How could he have possibly gotten to this point? Okay. Okay. It's March 2011 in Los Angeles, California. Despite it barely being a day after the end of winter, the sun was still okay. shining and the ambitious okay. creative individuals that characterized the city so were still creating. One of these ambitious creative... I just died. Okay. I don't... Okay, 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 okay. So... I can only jump. Residence was a Gosh, say I'm so loud. American by the name of Yusuf Erika, who at the time had just finished a degree in theater arts and was looking to become an actor, along with the other 50% of everyone in LA. Pretty quickly, Yusuf realized he had to do Oops. something to stand out from the crowd. And rather than taking the classic path to becoming an actor, okay. he decided to take initiative by uploading his work to YouTube against the recommendation of his university dean. I want to thank my theater arts okay. major dean who told me making a YouTube channel was the worst mistake I'll ever make in my acting career. Regardless, from the get-go, Yusuf seemed to have somewhat of a rebellious and ambitious drive. And at the time, his situation couldn't have gotten any worse if things went sour. At the time, I was broke. I was a waiter at Chili's, and I was a cashier at Best Buy, and I was literally living paycheck okay. to paycheck. However, his awful situation, his university dean's advice, and his lack of experience wasn't enough to stop him from taking his road less traveled. Yusuf Erekat would create his YouTube channel under the I name FoosyTube on the 21st of March 2011, deriving the name FoosyTube from rearranging the letters in his first name, Yusuf. And all you do is switch the Y and the F of my name. It's like magic. It's FoosyTube, because this is my tube, and you're watching me through your tube. Hi, tube. Foosy's initial goal on YouTube YouTube okay, 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 okay. So, the world one smile at a I can only jump. I can shoot. I can shoot. But Fuzzy would begin to achieve this goal after I just gotta learn the buttons before, before I jump right in. The so, A is shooting the audience I with bizarre personality for the first time. So, if you guys I a little died. background about who I am and That's who influenced me to, to become this I person died. that I am today, I'm gonna tell you guys a little about me. I died. You can call me Fuzzy. You can call me Yusuf. You, you can call me useless if you like, but as long as, like, watch my videos. Uh, like my videos and subscribe to my channel and I promise you I'll bring you funny things. And just like many other YouTubers, Fuzzy was starting from the ground up with no experience whatsoever. I decided so to start YouTube it. from the, from scratch. From zero subscribers. However, despite his lack of experience, so it wouldn't be long at all before Fuzzy would see his first bit of success. More surprisingly, it would only be on okay. his second upload. Only Ooh, he five thought, days he after thought. getting the channel, Fuzzy would upload Rebecca Black dancing That's Friday. That's crazy. To Apple when he gets considering to... Friday by Rebecca Black had been can released only two weeks beforehand, the song was trending. I can, I can. And when combined with Yusuf's crazy personality, the wait, algorithm wait. would promote the video, leading to FuzzyTube's first bit of growth. Of so I can duck the whole time, pretty much. From the beginning, it was obvious that Fuzzy was willing okay. to give it everything he had, wait. and would even begin to nope. use methods of borderline mm. desperation in order to get. Some oh wait, I'm on top. On the channel. I sent it to every single person. How on do my I? Friends. Uh, and I, am day I went out on the How streets do I hide? and publicized my channel. Well, we're gonna learn this game. We're gonna learn this game. FuzzyTube would then go on to upload a similar video to the okay. Rebecca Black video, That's only jump. with a Jennifer Lopez song and a more provocative outfit. This video okay. once again boosted FuzzyTube's subscriber count. So if I'm crouched, I can't However, move at all. There was somewhat of a problem here. There was only so many times Fuzzy could dance in okay. front of a webcam. Get on the elevator. He needed to change his content to something where he could implement Boom. a bit more variety. And it wouldn't be long at all before he would come. What is that? Oh, the lights went style. out. Yusuf, I'm coming. I'm going to make Yusuf? it. I'm going to make it. What? Oh, my God. Ooh. How do you send text? Naughty, naughty. I'm going to make July it. I'm going to make it. Approximately four months after beginning the channel, FuzzyTube would hit 3,500 subscribers and upload a video titled Middle Eastern Parents. Oh my god. I just got into Harvard. Good, good. Mama, I just got into a car accident. I'm gay. You're what? You're gay? You're gay. Oh, you get the rush. I gotta show you gay. This video had one element that all of his previously uploaded videos failed to incorporate. 
relatability. Viewers who are also of Middle Eastern descent found the stereotypes to be entertaining, and Fuzi would gain further loyal fans. This video would gain 93,000 views in the first week, despite Fuzi only having 5,000 subscribers, indicating to Fuzi that he should create more videos with a similar premise. For this reason, Fuzi would make it. I'm gonna make it. An array of different videos. Oh my god. Ooh. Hmm. Hello, everybody. Elevator, come back um, up, please. Nice to meet you Oh, that's kind of cool when the door opens. It like well doesn't. Dinner's almost ready. Who are you waiting for? Shoot through the door. Mama, I already ate at school today. I spent all this time. Okay, oh, it is like, oh shoot, I left you. All right, let's go back. Okay, we have a new thing on the dinner table tonight. This would ultimately prove nope. to be successful. No, 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 no. Easy, easy. to hit 20,000, 50,000, 75,000, and eventually 100,000 subscribers. Or do I go through stairs now? Channel. I can find my eyes out when I turn on his other subscribers. I remember. Sitting on my parents' couch, crying my eyes out because of how much it meant to me. Because I put blood, sweat, and tears into the journey. However, while the subscriber count was great, there was a problem. He crouches too now. Oh they no, we got. Of a limited audience, considering they were he crouches. Do I go through stairs now? Background to Fuzi. On top of this, Fuzi had signed up with a dodgy YouTube network who were taking a chunk of his money and giving him minimal value in return. It ended up being this one guy who lived in his house who had this fake YouTube network, and what he was doing was collecting all my money each month and then giving me maybe 2% of what I was actually earning. After two years of making the content, it's likely that Fuzi began to realize that there was a ceiling to his audience and it might be worthwhile looking into a genre that would appeal to everyone and anyone on YouTube. Fuzi's time making relatable Middle Eastern content was coming to an end. He had learned important oh, lessons oh about no, we got making and entertainment, and these lessons would prove to be vital for the next genre that FuzyTube would venture into. No, I couldn't do anything. What are you doing? Don't fight it, just let Did it I happen. Die? Oh, I was... I was there. In May 2013, FuzyTube would dip his toes into a new genre on the YouTube platform. This genre would later become somewhat of a meme, but at the time it was fresh and inviting for confident creators who were willing to Did embarrass themselves. Oh, I was... What up, everybody? Yusuf, aka FuzyTube, here, here with. The genre we're talking about is I pranking. Was and considering Fuzi fell was snugly there. into this category of confident creators, he would switch his focus to making videos for this genre. On the 22nd of May 2013, Fuzi would upload a video titled Hold My Hand Prank, Bruh. where he would approach strangers, hold their hand, and record the reaction. What's up? What's up? What's up? I wanted some love too. <laughs> no, no, no. This video performed reasonably well, gaining around 500,000 views in the first two weeks. The performance of this first video led to another video titled Gym Prank That's My Machine Bro. Huh? What the f do you think you're doing? I'm working out, bruh. Look at that video. Ah. It's okay. <gasps> which would once again perform above average, gaining 1 million views in the first month, likely indicating to Fuzi that it might be worth investing further energy into the prank genre. As time progressed and Fuzi continued to upload various semi-viral uploads, he would switch his content entirely to pranks, which by late 2013 had overtaken all of his most popular Middle Eastern videos in view count, and by early 2014 had taken him over the 1 million subscriber mark. However, while Fuzi's success was giving him the facade of a happy, pleasant guy, it would be around this same point in time that his audience would begin to realize that Fuzi had a much more difficult life behind the scenes. There's so much shit, man, that you guys don't see that happens behind the scenes of being a YouTuber in these business meetings and in all these things and everything that just drive me crazy. And, you know, it might look like I'm just living in... In mid-2014, while Fuzi's prominence in the pranking was, scene was continuing to rise, it would come there. to the attention of his fans that while there. appearing content on the outside, things were much different behind the scenes. For the first time in my life, I had a severe, severe, severe mental breakdown, there. nervous breakdown, and this I want to call it a manic episode crazy. because I really feel like there was something psychotic in what I did next. Yusuf explained that shortly after moving to LA, he would get tattoos and piercings with the goal of fitting in. However, would shortly come to the realization that he would not be accepted within the Muslim community with these body modifications. Yeah, your I'm family's like gonna see old this. Old your, your tubians are gonna see this. The people who hate you are gonna see this. Like, it, it struck a chord in me so, so, so deep that I thought my life was over. While telling the tattoo story, Fuzi would yeah, have I his first breakdown like playing some old retro games. Audience. I know I'm a de depressed it's like, who's, who's really gonna, who's really gonna watch this? Got your kneecaps. Last dude on YouTube, but it's because I got so much. I was spamming it, bro. And to to whatever your guys is. This information is unimportant at this point in the story, Ooh, but will be vital for later parts of the video. Oh, lights go and while Fuzi was clearly struggling to some extent me. behind the scenes, on the surface things were going go excellently down. for the Fuzi 2 
YouTube channel. After surpassing one million Hate subscribers, that I can't Uzi crouch. Uzi can only to grow, oh, that many that would have made me OP. Oh, I can jump. Okay. And eating people's food prank. You know, the beach is like a really nice place to just come and relax. Like, I like to just bring food here sometimes and just eat. You know what I'm saying? However, it would be with another viral video that FoozyTube would become somewhat of a household name on the YouTube platform. The Yoga Pants Prank. Yo, did you just stare at my butt? You just stared at my butt. Now, despite this video clearly being extremely fake, to simply say that the video performed well would be the understatement of the century. Within only one week, the video had gained 10 million views. And within two months, this video had doubled Fousey's subscriber count to 3 million. But Fousey was really only heating up his dinner with the yoga pants prank, as he was about to back it up with his two most popular uploads <laughs> ever. Oh my gosh, that was... Real life um... prank and the Mortal Kombat elevator prank, both of which to this day having well over 100 million. Views. The views from these videos once again caused Fousey's subscriber count to surge, pushing him to 4 million, 5 million, 6 million, then 7 million, at which point he would upload a video thanking his audience for the insane milestone. Like I like proved everybody wrong for 2 million. Three. Retro games. It's like, who's, who's really gonna, who's, who? what if, what if, that would be crazy. Based on like just playing some old retro games. Retro games. Retro games. Retro games. Do, do. Playing some old retro games. It's like who's who's really gonna who's really gonna watch this? We got two new caps. Oh, but what if? But what if? Boom, dun, 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 dun. So. It's like who's who's really gonna who's really gonna watch this? Ah. It's like who's who. Let's go back. Games. It's like who's who's really gonna who's really gonna watch this? We got two new caps. It's like who's who's really gonna who's really gonna watch this? We got two new caps. Retro games. It's like who's it should it be slower, bro? I'm like so guessing. Games. It's like who's who's really gonna who's really gonna watch this? We got two new caps. I was spamming it, bro, and he still got me. Give me. So the lights go out. He almost shot me. Go down. Hate that I can't crouch on the elevator. That would have made me OP. Oh, I can jump. I can jump. Okay, I can't go any further. Nope. Oh, that's a wall there. Do it. I'll come out the door. Okay, okay, okay. Nope. Ooh. I'm making it. I'm making it. Wait. Those doors. Wait. Those doors. Wait. Yeah. Three million, four million, five million. How many do we have right now? Almost seven. Almost seven? Yes, sir. While also explaining that he had been nominated for the channel of the year at the streaming awards. That is the biggest Wait. award you can get. So not only is okay. those doors. It's so loud in my There's no lights on on this floor. Go, 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 go. Oh, wait, I can go back down. Do, 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 do
think I can just jump down there, to be honest. What are you trying to go in the elevator for? I'm dead. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I just played this. I'm, I'm like. Mm, the elevator for. I'm dead. Ooh, finesse. Trying to go in the elevator for. I'm dead. Uh. It was two. I didn't even notice. Trying to go in the elevator for. <laughs> trying to go in the elevator for. Oh my gosh, it was touching me. Wait, 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 wait. Boom, 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 boom. Could make it different color. Make it, make it, we can make it. I don't know. Blockbuster. Always. Retro vibes. Okay, so. We're trying to go in the elevator for. Slow it down by a lot. On the elevator for. I'm dead. Ooh, finesse. I finesse that. I finesse that. I. I that, that, that. And then we split it like this. Yeah. <sighs> then we put it right there. Then. Ooh, finesse! I finesse that. I finesse that. I. I that, that, that. Look, I'm almost there. Please, 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 just keep going down. Ah. Please, please, just keep going down. No. Okay, so I jumped down. Okay, so. We'll have it like this. Okay, so. <clears throat>
What? It, it, it's just like doing like, oh, here's what your progress. What? What? Go down. Oh my gosh. <laughs> if you combine this with the fact that Fuji Tube have completely Bro, this 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 game is cheating, bro. So I see tomorrow dose of truth. This is what you play at the arcade and you lose all your money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um. Dot. I can still go there. I thought I, I. Okay. Okay, I can't go anymore. Oh, okay, okay. I'll get a little coin. Oh my gosh. If he would have. Stop. I have to jump. I have to jump. I have to jump. Stop. Blah 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 Stop Stop to me He tried to get me he tried to get me with the crouch Oh my gosh we're there No no oh oh my gosh Oh my gosh But like why what 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 wonder why Go, 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 go. How come, how come I have to start over? What is that? I don't have to start. Because I missed doors or something? Finish. Oh. I almost thought I forgot which button was jump. All right. Oh my gosh, I'm No! Oh my gosh, I must died. Let me just go to this one. Mm -hmm. Let me just, just go to this one. What's this one? Ooh. Ooh. They can't get me. They can't get me. Oh my gosh. Please leave me alone. Okay. Oh no. Okay, I'm done. I thought I was going to finish it, but I'm done. I'm done. All right, guys. If you, I try to. Maybe next time I'll do like. If you enjoyed, um. Maybe next. Pranking, then you'll already have somewhat of an idea as to what I'm going to talk about next. By late 2016, pranking as a whole, the genre that Fuzzy had become known for, began to slow down. Fuzzy had somewhat of a reputation for creating fake pranks. Hey, I'm Shane Barbera. I was in Fuzzy Tube's uh, Uber prank. Um, it's fake. And back in the heyday of YouTube pranking, you could kind of get away with it because people were still naive enough to think that they might be real. But by 2016, as more and more people were getting exposed through H3H3 and other sources, he sits Maybe down next in a time room I'll do like with an actor who you're not supposed to think is an actor. Fake pranks just didn't really fly with the general YouTube audience any longer. This put a Maybe. bullet hole in the structure of Fuzzy's channel while simultaneously diminishing the integrity of Why is this one going to be videos. stuck? They're watching like, this prank. They laugh, they smile. I thought I was going to finish. Yeah. It doesn't matter if the person who streamed, like, they didn't know or not. It's entertainment. It left Maybe next. With two options. He could either continue making the fake pranks that he was known for or move on to a new video style. Well, Fuzzy instead picked Time up I'll to do three like to disappear altogether, resulting retro in games. a seven-month hiatus. So let's just put all of this together. Fuzzy's main video style pranks were no longer feasible on the platform. He's reached the 10 million subscriber mark, likely reducing the motivation he had for making Maybe. videos. And he's also I taken seven months off without yeah. saying hello. Obviously, he's not Why is this one going to be stuck? Like, I can be wrong. there. This His is views like, have gone to drop, which is exactly what happened. Fuzzy went from 5 to 15 million views per video before Please leave a like, follow, to between 500,000 and 3 million per 
This is best articulated by his monthly view count. Hope you enjoyed. We can see that Fuzzy had one of his best months in retro series. Then he takes a great play with Zing. I love y'all. Remember, anyone can become a hero, especially. And just in case this scenario wasn't already bad enough, YouTube was about to hit Fuzzy with another piece of negative motivation. Sometimes the two million views with ridiculous watch was paying me. $457. At around the same point that Fuzzy's reputation was on the decline, YouTube would drop FuzzyTube's pay significantly, where he was only making around 5% of what he would normally make on the videos he was posting. If you got 1 million views in 24 hours, with this much watch time, how much are you getting paid? It was between $8,000 and $12,000. Wow. Fuzzy began to talk with YouTube to see why he was no longer receiving a comparable income on his videos, but they simply had no answers to give him. All YouTube kept giving me back was, we're sorry, we don't know a solution at this point, we don't know what's wrong, we're looking into it. Mm -hmm. And I got that again, and again, and again, and again. And for someone like Fuzzy, whose motivation seemed to be primarily financial, this would have been a massive hit to his motivation. This hit to his motivation caused the views to once again dwindle to a point where by 2018, he was receiving an average of only one. Fuzzy's mental health appeared to be on the decline again, likely owing to his declining channel. A lot of the times, other people around your life don't fully recognize what you're going through because oh, we choose head. not to show them, because we don't want them to know. This led up to an apex in July 2018, Dude, a month in which welcome all back, of the negative life would be brought to the surface. Look, I've been away, I've been playing some post. Fuzzy began to explain business. that he was hosting an event that would be at the next Coachella. Oh, we just birthed oh, the next Coachella. Coachella. Called the Hate Dies, Love Arrives motivational event for his fans. Many YouTubers were skeptical about the event because of Fuzzy's decline in mental health and elevator motivation for the show. What about the criticism that like, like maybe you want to do this to show that you did it for you? However, Fuzzy would go on to host it anyway, and it was an absolute disaster. He organized and promoted through social media what he called the Hate Dies Love Arrives concert at the Greek Theater. But when someone called in a bomb threat, 1,500 concert goers had to evacuate. Before the show started, someone would call in a troll bomb threat, causing the entire event to be shut down. No actual device was located. However, due to the direct threat, it was uh, determined that uh, the venue should be evacuated. And rather than heading home after it was shut down, he took the show out onto the street, where he would completely embarrass himself in front of a live audience and ultimately the internet. I'm about to give a speech for the people that was delivered to me from God. Fuzzy was clearly having some mental issues during his speech, framing himself as some kind of prophet from God in front of his fans, even getting into a fight with Keemstar, who was in the audience of the event. I have bipolar and depression. That's what you put into my head made me want to kill myself. Fuzzy would then go on to tell a story about how Drake was going to be at the event. The story how I met Drake. I guarantee you I'll be with Drake tonight in the club. I promise you that. Which was later debunked by other YouTubers. We reached out to like Drake's people and uh, they said that he had no plan to play there. Okay, I want you to hit up the number that I have on my phone. Drake was in New York during this event, by the way. <laughs> he was most definitely not gonna come. Following this event, Keemstar would release a documentary titled The Hard Truth About FuzzyTube, in which he would expose Fuzzy for the insanity of the event. I go, I can't even convince my own mother that I'm not crazy. On the same day that Keemstar would post his documentary, Fuzzy would once again disappear off YouTube, this time for a full year. Upon his return in August 2019, Fuzzy would lose 90,000 subscribers in two months, also uploading a video talking about his one year break. So thank you guys so much for embracing my return so well. 
I thank you guys. I couldn't thank you enough. But now we got to get down to business. And despite Fuji talking about getting down to business, his business had dried up significantly. Mm. Fuji went from getting around 1 million views per video before his break to around 300,000 views per video upon returning. However, despite only getting 300,000 views per episode on the vlogs, Fuji would experiment with a new video idea that proved to be extremely successful, his YouTube crib series. Here on YouTube Cribs, we like to show you the luxurious life of YouTubers. In this series, Fuji decided he would meet with various big YouTubers giving them an opportunity to show off their properties. So basically we want you to take us around and show us what you want to show us, like showcase your home to us. Fuji met up with individuals like Logan Paul, Lance Stewart, Tanner Fox, and Alex Wasabi, with most videos gaining more than 1 million views. Could this be the return of FuziTube back to his former position of glory? Well, unfortunately not. As shortly after posting these four episodes, Fuji would take another six month break, failing to upload any more YouTube Cribs episodes. After this six month break, Fuji's views would drop to around only 100 thousand per video where they've remained up until this day. On the 2nd of February 2021, Fuji seems to have given up on the FuziTube channel after uploading a video titled My Last Video on this channel. In this video, Fuji explained that he would be releasing a book which is currently available for pre-order on Amazon. It went out for pre-order. It's the number one bestseller right now. Yeah. Fuzi now seems to be primarily focusing on music as well as his podcast channel titled Gotta Get It, in which Fuzi has been posting what seems to be weekly videos. We'd like to welcome you to our new podcast. This is going to be episode number one, and we're super excited for you to be a part of our adventure. However, the likelihood that this channel will return him to where he was at his peak is extremely slim. However, I could be wrong. Over the years, FuziTube has proven that he has the mindset, work ethic, and intelligence to grow an impossibly small piece of media into an online behemoth, as seen with FuziTube. However, what was the cost for FuziTube? Not only financially, but mentally. The toll that the YouTube roller coaster took on FuziTube seems to be immeasurable. From crazy rants to his audience on the street, to depressive breaks sitting at home doing nothing for months on end. You might question as to whether or not his journey was a positive. Did his manic episodes contribute to his success, or were they the eventual result of his downfall? What was the true price of fame for Yusuf Erekat? What lies in the future for FuziTube? These seem to be the most prominent questions when reflecting on the rise and fall of FuziTube, aka Yusuf Erekat. <laughs> There's a major problem on YouTube where you have to clickbait, and if you don't clickbait, viewership is going to drop and interaction drops. One week after his father's death, and he already has to clickbait his dead father. I have to clickbait every video. I hate these videos, and it's because he just clickbaits, they're boring, they're fake. I don't want to have to clickbait all the time. I wish YouTube wasn't the platform that it is now. And the clickbait has just gotten worse and worse over the past couple years. Everybody is calling the vlogs that I upload lately clickbait. And you know what I'm talking about. Chances are you're one of the people that said it. Everything that I upload, clickbait, this is clickbait, oh look, more clickbait. And every time the beauty of the internet is that it usually rewards excellence and punishes liars, cheaters, and just general scumbags. In a YouTube setting, for example, there's only so far you can go with your clickbait before you're called out on your lunacy. And I think that day is long past for Kid Behind a Camera. If you haven't heard of Kid Behind a Camera, he's basically what remains of the Angry Grandpa show following Angry Grandpa's death in late 2017. However, since Angry Grandpa passed away, Kid Behind a Camera has been constantly criticized for exploiting his death for views. 48 hours after he dies, you have a t-shirt that says, rest in peace, Grandpa. Is that a real thing? Is that a real t-shirt you have? On top of this, the provision of clickbait on Kid Behind a Camera's channel has slowly led numerous people to boycott the content. A move that's slowly decaying the reputation of Kid Behind a Camera in case it isn't already bad enough. Let's talk about the clickbait nature of your videos, because this is the thing I saw most frequently. 
our house is for sale where bro this is the standard kind of clickbaity title that you might see on pretty much any of kid behind the camera's videos however upon clicking the video it's an awfully filmed drinking pool water prank with acting levels so bad that it could probably be sent in as an audition for the room too it like de-ages you within like 24 hours like seven years are you serious yes have you how have you not heard about this it's like the newest thing what? <laughs> I'm actually kind of starting to see why people watch this. It's like so bad that it's kind of good. But seriously, did Kid Behind a Camera get the boys from Oc TV to come over and do some acting lessons with them? This is Oc TV. Seems like almost everyone watching is thinking the same thing as well. Some of these comments. Terry T says, y'all have enough money that you could buy acting lessons. And I agree with this comment to some extent. Maybe not with the buying acting lessons part. But after producing garbage content like this for years, surely you'd get a little bit better at producing a more convincing scenario. This kind of dialogue and acting level could probably be pumped out by a kid with a new camera. <laughs> but let's give them the benefit of the doubt on this one. This is only the first part of the video. Maybe in later parts of the video, they do reveal some consistency with the title by revealing that they are in fact selling their house and are broke. Let's examine the first half of the title, the statement that they're selling their house. Then let's watch the video to see if this is actually the case. We're not selling our house. No, this is not the time to do it because we're gonna get over if we do it right now. You're not selling our house because this happens every year. Okay, so you've actually blatantly said in the video, no, you're not selling your house. And you've also made it very clear in the video that you have no intention of selling your house. Wait. The title proclaiming that you're selling your house was actually just a real estate agent dropping their card off saying that they that's offer his real face. estate agent. All right, so that's proven the first half of the title to be clickbait. You're clearly not selling your house. What about the second half of the title? We're broke in big asterisks. We're good. We have a lot of money. Loads of I it. don't want to talk about money. We're going to be broke, Bridget, okay? Michael, we're good. Ad rates are pretty low right now. Views are in the toilet. We might want to talk about it. Michael, honey, we are fine. I check monthly. Honey, we're good. Okay, so not only are they not broke, they're actually saying quite the contrary. They're saying they're very financially sound. Even going so far as to say that they have a lot of money. So considering all that, I guess I'll rephrase the title for you guys, and I'll do this for free, considering you are broke. Or, or wait, maybe you're not. Because looking at your social blade between Angry Grandpa and Kid Behind the Camera, you're gaining about 30 million views per month. At $2 per thousand views, that's about 60 grand a month. Plus throw in merch sales and you're probably bordering about $1 million per year. And not that there's anything wrong with having money, like quite the contrary, more power to you. But earning almost a million dollars a year and putting in your title that you're broke just to get clicks is a little disingenuous to me. Perhaps a more appropriate title would be a real estate agent put a card in our mailbox asking if we want to sell. We don't want to sell our house, we have money. In Kid Behind the Camera's interview with Boogie2988 back in 2018, his justification for the clickbait was that without the clickbait, it just wasn't as interesting. But my question is, <laughs> why Why do you do that? What's the point? Well, the most basic answer I can give right now, just to that one point, is what else am I, am I going to call the video? I guess Boogie2988, you know what I mean? I mean, like, sure. That's not uh. interesting, though. Like... Uh. So by this dogma, you're saying that I can call this video whatever I want as long as it's interesting at the end of the day. Okay. How about Kid Behind a Camera has died? How about Angry Grandpa Returns from the Dead? How about Kid Behind a Camera, Angry Grandpa, Hospital Rap Battle Collab featuring Eminem and Tupac Shakur? There's no limitation to what I call it, guys, because if I call it something else, it just wouldn't be as interesting. It's the same argument that, like, idiotic feminists use on things like the gender pay gap. There's only one reason for the difference in men and women's pay. Gender. It's a stupid single layer argument that fails to take into account all the other equally important factors just because it makes sense on a super basic level. There's only one reason I need clickbait because it's not as interesting without it. No, there's way more at play here. Let's look a little bit further. There's a major problem on YouTube where you have to clickbait and if you don't clickbait, viewership is going to drop and interaction drops and everything again he's saying this the wrong way you can still get viewers by having an enticing title and thumbnail then matching good content with that enticing title and thumbnail however the problem is it's hard to match good content with an enticing title and thumbnail if the content isn't good i don't want to have to click bait. i wish youtube wasn't the platform that it is now where i have to click bait every video i don't want to do that man the issue is not with youtube the issue is that you need to click bait when your content is completely uninteresting it's so easy to blame YouTube and just say, oh yeah, it's 
It's YouTube's fault and I need a quick bait, not mine at all. Of course, that's the easiest possible solution. Just blame someone else. And if Darkside Phil has told us anything, it's that blaming YouTube and not yourself kills the channel pretty damn quickly because you're expecting something massive to change like YouTube. You can't change YouTube, you can only change yourself. 60,000 videos on YouTube and you're still broke. Yeah, you're right. You want to know why, Tower Cat? Because YouTube f***ed me. And that's just the classic case of refusing to take responsibility. Look, I'll point out the real reason why Kid Behind a Camera needs to clickbait. His content is garbage, that's why. And here's a supporting yeah, theory for that. Me. Kid Behind a Camera's new video was hyped on Twitter in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 14 different tweets. Kid Behind a Camera clearly knew that by his standard, this new video was a good video comparative to the rest. So the result? No clickbait. Big surprise. Now, obviously, one video isn't rock-solid evidence. However, I find it interesting that... How bad the video seems to correlate pretty well with how hard it's clickbaited on the Kid Behind the Camera channel. The second and possibly more insidious thing the Kid Behind the Camera has been criticised for is the financial exploitation of Angry Grandpa's death. 48 hours after he dies, you have a t-shirt that says, Rest in Peace Grandpa. That a real thing? That That's a real Francis. Thing? Now, this might be a difficult topic to cover because ethics aren't really universal. What might seem ethical to someone might not seem ethical to someone else. Like, for example, in the clickbait option, we can just go through, we can have a look at a few different videos, and we can pretty easily tell if it's clickbait or not. But with this next part, you really have to take morality into account. I think. Just getting down lower. Oh wow. He really doesn't like Boogie. I almost watched all of his videos. Who the fuck is that? Yo, is that somebody at my door? Huh? Yeah. I'm not sure telling you guys that is a good idea, but I, I what, what can you possibly do, right? What you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for Dang. In this video, we are gonna look at it's IRL streaming, bro. That's where it kind of gets you. It's crazy. Was there a specific reason or reaction that Ice Poseidon would give to the squatters, which gave them an overwhelming desire to come back and continue to squat him? Was it the result of his notoriously toxic audience, or was it the result of his IRL streaming environment. We're going to look at and analyze all of the minor swats working our way up, and by the end, we will have covered the Big Bertha, the infamous plane swat that had him recognized everywhere from small Reddit all the way up to national television. The guy taking off the flight at says he was a victim of a prank bomb threat against that plane. But maybe first we should cover the question for those unfamiliar with the art of the swat. What is squatting? Squatting is basically the act of calling law enforcement or emergency services such as police or the SWAT team to an individual's house or location pretty much just to mess with them and confront them. It is popular among streaming communities because if a specific streamer's address or location gets leaked, ruining their whole stream or day is just one phone call away. It gives the caller a backward sense of power, knowing that they can bring down a big streamer with just one phone call. Mm -hmm. Let me reassure you, squatters are not powerful. In fact, they are the biggest losers Wait. in Blue Blue on this oh planet. Gosh. Check out this Chad Squatter. <laughs> Yuck. Yeah, real tough, man. The streamer is usually a little bit pissed or a little bit confused, and the law enforcement usually has mixed reactions. In Ice Poseidon's case, some of the cops were chill about the whole thing. You were calling and making up stuff, so I, like, you guys haven't, you can't even have guns and stuff like that. Yeah. You were calling, I guess. 
Yeah, so I do like live streams. People call and be like, oh, he's a gun or something, you know. Yeah, and I can see why as a prank if you're talking to him, you say, well, I, I'm just gonna call him. And so. Well, some cops are the exact opposite, especially in the serious watch like the infamous Blaine squad. Now, you might want to blame ICE or you might want to blame the audience. Either way, I think that we can all agree that Ice Poseidon, aka Paul Danino, was an absolute SWAT mate. Now, this is the argument we have at hand. It makes sense to blame the audience for the swatting since they're the people that are making the call. But how does this make sense when certain streamers with way more viewers never got swatted while Ice Poseidon consistently got swatted over and over and over again? Because they know where he is. I'll tell you what I think and then you can tell me what you think. Now, the three sides of the occasion are one, Ice Poseidon's streaming environment, two, Ice Poseidon's viewers or audience, and finally three, Ice Poseidon's personality and demeanor, and especially his reaction to the swap. So let's start by firstly talking about Ice Poseidon's streaming environment. Now it's obvious, when you're an IRL streamer, you're gonna be way more susceptible to swatting, right? You are constantly walking through public areas which are gonna be easily identifiable to anyone as long as they know the general location that the streamer is streaming, especially if they're socially iconic areas like LA or New York. And Ice Poseidon was pretty much always streaming in LA. You'd be getting swatted significantly less if you were streaming on some random dirt road in some hillbilly area in who knows where. So this is a point of blame. If Ice Poseidon is consistently in easily identifiable areas, then that could be the main reason for him getting swatted, right? Well, this doesn't explain two things. Firstly, why does he still get swatted at home, like in this clip? Hello? Oh my god, who the fuck is that? Yo, is that somebody at my door? Oh fuck. Hold on, give me a second. You hear that fucking knock? He knocked from Satan, dude. Actually, not what you think it was. They're actually stream snipers, and they wanted to say hi. <laughs> when you come and say hi. <laughs> okay, so thanks, dude. Thank you. Sure, I society gets swatted way more out in public, but if he's still getting swatted at home, it kind of checks off the point that he's only getting swatted because he's in public areas that people recognize. Secondly, why don't we see other large IRL streamers getting swatted as much as Ice Poseidon, such as maybe like Andy Milanakis or Jason Bay. Andy Milanakis was in the same social circle as Ice Poseidon, and I tried to look for a clip of him getting swatted on YouTube, and I couldn't even find a single one, so I'd assume that he's never been swatted. I'm here with a, a very important person. He's near and dear to my heart. I met him once. If Ice Poseidon and Andy Milanakis were in that same LA, USA environment and Ice was consistently getting swatted and Andy was not, blaming the location and recognizable businesses is too shallow of an argument. We'd have to dig a little deeper. But we will end this point by saying that if you are streaming out in public, obviously you're going to have a much higher chance of getting swatted than those people who are streaming at home. So the environment definitely has some bearing on the amount of times that Ice Poseidon is swatted. But it's not the environment alone. We have to talk about the audience. The audience, the infamous Purple Army. Anyone who is a long-time fan of Ice Poseidon knows about the Purple Army and probably knows about their capabilities, shall we say. Listen, dudes. Ice Poseidon is not a virgin. See, that's Bitches on the phone. They want their see that's Too many fly hards, I'd rather see some see that's Now everybody in the chat is fan see that's See that's What's the original song? I forgot see it. Oh. We are the Purple Army see that Oh shit, this is see so good. <laughs> see that's The Purple Army was the name of Ice Poseidon's followers and they had a reputation for being the most toxic audience on the whole of Twitch. One main example of this, when Ice Poseidon was away from his computer swimming in his pool, I think it was for a bet or something, his viewers consistently donated to the stream with racist messages attached in the attempt to get Ice banned from Twitch, which he did for one week. Losing on HD1, right? Not you. His own fans got Ice Poseidon banned for a week. Not exactly the greatest, most loyal fan base. So like the environment point, it's easy to say that Ice was consistently swatted because of a factor that's out of his control. His audience was toxic. But then it creates another argument. 
is the toxicity of Ice Poseidon's audience his responsibility or did he just happen upon having a more toxic audience? This is a point of debate, but I think we could all agree that generally streamers attract viewers who are similar to them in personality and outlook on the world. Now, I don't know if I'd go so far as to call Ice Poseidon toxic, but I would say that watching Ice Poseidon's early videos, we can tell that he does have the desire to mess with people for a laugh. So right now I'm closing the door. <laughs> you were trying to get in. Oh, oh fuck you. <laughs> and fuck you. <laughs> if Ice Poseidon had this desire to mess with people and his viewers really resonated with that, chances are that some of Ice Poseidon's viewers, or even most of Ice Poseidon's viewers, are going to share that same desire to mess with people. Now what happens when you take thousands of these people who have this desire to ruin people and put them into one stream? You get an Ice Poseidon stream and something bad is bound to happen. So I'd probably argue that Ice Poseidon's toxic audience was a result of his own personality, which is a perfect segue into the nitty gritty of why Ice Poseidon was truly a SWAT magnet. Now for the final segment of this video, we're going to talk about Ice Poseidon specifically and especially his reaction and subconscious encouragement to the SWAT. So let's begin by analyzing the infamous flame SWAT. I'm just on 53A, is my, that's my gate. And I'm not sure telling you guys that is a good idea, but I, I, what, what can you possibly do, right? That, right there. What can you guys possibly do? It was the most encouraging little statement for the SWATters, which probably brought him down in this case. I think if he never said that, he never would have been SWATted on this train and he never would have been banned from Twitch. What can you guys possibly do doesn't mean much to Ice Poseidon, it's just another statement. But to a SWATter, all they hear is, Oh my god, there's a chance that I can bring Ice Poseidon down here. Man, I'm like literally just sitting here and just thinking about how much of a loser of a human being you have to be to be a SWATter. <laughs> Ice Poseidon saying, what can you possibly do, doesn't deter the SWATters. It only creates a challenge for them. So that's the before mindset. He gives out subconscious cues that encourages the SWATters. But what about after the SWAT happens? Does he just ignore it? No, he does the exact opposite. He puts the SWATters on a pedestal. Let's discuss some examples. Ice Poseidon gets SWATted, 445,000 views two years ago. Or this one, five videos later. SWATted on a plane, my perspective. 357,000 views. Now obviously we can see why Ice Poseidon would post these videos. Ice Poseidon would have thought that these videos would get loads of views, which they did. But over the long run, do you think that posting videos about being swatted that you know have the potential to go semi-viral is going to encourage the swatters or deter them? It's going to encourage them. Swatters are going to have significantly more reason to swat you if they know that the swat might have the potential to go semi-viral. Put yourself in the mind of a swatter. Well, sorry, I just kind of put you in the mind frame of a massive loser. You guys are all bloody legends, but... Uh, Let's just pretend for one second that we are all losers who are called SWATters. Now the reason that SWATters do this is to get this feeling of power or significance, right? How much more powerful are you going to feel if you know that you're not only going to ruin Ice Poseidon's stream, but you might also be the perpetrator for a video that's going to get about 500,000 views on YouTube. I guess the question for Ice Poseidon would be, do you value the short-term views of the video or do you value the long-term not getting SWATted at all? Regardless, we can all agree that posting the videos of the SWAT is only going to encourage the SWATters, not the opposite. But Ice Poseidon did eventually catch on to this and decided that he was no longer going to encourage the trolls by posting the SWATs on YouTube. In fact, in this video, a terrorist is trying to rule my life, help me, begins by saying, We have made a point to no longer include anything related to SWATting on the channel, but I'm unsure of how to resolve this problem after the last situation. But in the 10 minutes following the initial statement, Ice Poseidon does something that makes the SWATting problem worse. He complains about the SWATters for 10 minutes in the hope that they will stop. Bad move. Now I do feel really empathetic for Ice Poseidon in this situation because he was backed into a corner and he really had no idea how to stop the SWATting. And we can all see where he's coming from when he posted this video. And it makes sense to post a video desperately pleading with the SWATters to try and make them stop. But Ice fails to realize that this is just not how human psychology works. The key to getting the SWATter to stop is to give them the most I don't care reaction possible. Now what is posting a 10 minute video complaining about the SWATters actually doing? It's showing that you care so much about being swatted that you will post a 10 minute video dedicated to it. Again, we have to put ourselves in the mind of the swatter. They don't see this as, wow, I'm really a piece of shit for constantly calling the cops on Ice Poseidon. They see this as, yes, I am getting recognized for my efforts 
I need to continue this to maintain my validation. Okay. Okay. Time to beat it. Time to beat it. I'm gonna go up. Oh my god. Oh my gosh. Mm, I was on the elevator, that's why I didn't crouch. He cheated, he cheated, oh my god. Slugs is my gosh. Fire jump stuck in the thing. Who was the voice actor for that?
I was trying to get in. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> Dang it. Just keep going. Oh. oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Heavy machine gun. Oh my gosh. Guys, leave, bro. Start. I tried to jump with a I jumped. things are
Ulti. With just a pistol. Mission complete. Mission three. I'm already over it. <laughs> we'll come back to retro games.
young friend. Hmm. Seems a pleasant enough little place. Shane Bard. Everything's all right now. as a troll you pull What you've done to helpless beasts.
Too late for you to learn the error of your ways. This could prove dangerous if I'm not careful. See if I can do this real quick. Give me a minute, give me a minute, give me a minute. 
験に。